Welcome back to ECE 501B. If you're just now seeing these dates, I apologize for them rapidly coming at you, but homework number five is due. You basically can do it now, and it's due because I like to have you have a weekend to work on them. It's due a week from Thursday. Homework six is not so long in horizon. Homework six is due the following Monday because we have an exam that Wednesday. So the fifth is the Wednesday before homecoming. Homecoming is like you're paying attention, but that sort of gives me a mile marker to work from. And then we will have a project and a final exam. There's only two exams this semester and some homeworks. I think we may only have two more homework assignments after these two. And then we have more project related material. Today what I want to do is continue with chapter six. I'm not sure that we will complete chapter six, but chapter six is dealing with inner product spaces, which give us a link. And today we will learn about the angle between vectors. And now we can think about vectors having links and angles, and they all depend on the inner product that we select, and the inner products are not necessarily equal, meaning when you see angle bracket U comma V close the angle bracket, you have to be told or somebody needs to say what is the inner product that you are using for your particular work. Once we've done that, found or defined an inner product, we can talk about length. We left you with a homework assignment on your own to do this orthogonal decomposition, meaning if you're given a vector u and a vector v, can you separate that vector u into a piece that's in the direction of v and another component that's actually orthogonal to v? So can we separate u into two pieces? And we'll go over that, and that should be a review based on you doing your homework assignment that we said was assigned at the end of last lecture. Then the inner product will give us the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality, CSI, so we can do some investigating. Cauchy-Schwarz inequality is what I will simply refer to as CSI. And that now gives us that the magnitude or the absolute value of U and V, because we learned last time that the inner product can be negative. So we're interested in the magnitude, the absolute value of that inner product, and that's now less than the norms of U and V. And because of what we know about absolute values, we could say, oh, that inner product is bigger than or equal to the negative of that magnitude of U and V, or it's less than the magnitude of U and V. So it can be, it's bounded by a negative number and a positive number. If we divide both sides through by the norm of the product of U and V, we will see that now we have that quantity, inner product UV over norm U, norm V, is between minus one and one. And that we can think of like the cosine of an angle, which now allows us to think about this quantity of the inner product scaled as the cosine of an angle. And that gives us this angle between vectors. Then we start getting become being able to play with the geometry that we learned in high school, except now we're generalizing those ideas. We'll talk about a triangle inequality, and again, these are generalizations of what you're used to seeing. And so if you get hung up, just go back to the geometric picture that you're used to, but now we have the norm of the sum of two vectors 
is less than or equal to the sum of the norms of those two vectors, we will have a parallelogram equality, and I like to sort of think of the back of an envelope, and you'll understand what I mean by that in a, in a little bit when we get there, but we now have an equality from a parallelogram. We will hopefully get into orthonormal basis, and then how we can build these orthonormal bases using a process called the Gram-Schmidt process, which allows us to now start to just construct these basis vectors that are orthogonal and normalized to have a norm of one. That's where we're headed. Maybe I've already sort of given this synopsis, but let's review. We're dealing with chapter six, inner product spaces. We've defined that to be these angle brackets where u and v are vectors in our vector space v, and that inner product produces a scalar in our field of numbers. F could be R or C. And the inner product has different properties. It has a positivity property, which says it's non-negative. It has a definiteness property, which says if the inner product is zero, then the vector itself must be the zero vector. It has additivity in the first slot, and that now allows us to break up that first slot summation into two pieces. It has homogeneity in the first slot. That scalar simply slides right out if it's in the first slot. And last time, what happens to that scalar if it's in the second slot? Do you remember? We can slide it out also, but it has to be slid out with its conjugate. But these are the properties that we want our inner product to possess. And then if we reverse the order of our ordered pair, then we need to conjugate that result. Question? So, yes, the positivity is now saying that this is greater than or equal to zero. Let me see if I can sort of rephrase your question. And now that means that it's a real number. So this inner product is going to, when you have the inner product of a vector with itself, it needs to now produce a real value. So you could have an inner product with, two unlike vectors, and that may give you something that what? We just said it has to be in the field of numbers. But here, if you have a vector inner product with itself, there's a lot going on between that non-negative zero vector, or non-negative zero, that's a scalar. Question? So you could probably come up with a lot of abstract fields. We are going to simply be focusing on the real numbers and the complex numbers as our fields. And I wouldn't make it any more difficult than that allows us to do for now. But you could probably create some fields that you could now make this more abstract. And then the title of our textbook might be abstract linear vector spaces or abstract vector spaces. And we've talked a little bit about that or seen some examples of that. Then we can have a norm defined, and again, that depends critically on the inner product that we've selected. But we simply take the inner product of a vector with itself and then take the square root of that. We can also then find if we scale that a vector by a scalar a and we look at the norm squared, then that's just taking the norm squared of the original vector and scaling it by the absolute value of that scalar squared. And that's hopefully somewhat clear by 
that sequence of steps sliding the homogeneity of A out in the first slot and in the second slot we've shown that if you slide it out it comes out with a conjugate and now just remembering what we know about complex numbers A times its conjugate gives us the absolute value of that scalar squared. If two vectors are orthogonal, that means that their inner product is zero. And here was your homework, was to actually find this scalar quantity right here. which was A in our homework assignment. We said pick, find an A that will allow you to basically decompose a vector U into two parts. One that's in the direction of V and the other that is orthogonal to V. We will derive this. But it's really just when you see the inner product of u and v, that's really just telling you how those vectors essentially align or how nicely they align. They could align very strongly, and if they don't align at all, what's their inner product? Zero. Then they're orthogonal. And we're normalizing that alignment by the norm squared of our vector v. So let's derive that. Here's the orthogonal decomposition and this is where we sort of left off last time. We're given two vectors, u and v, in a vector space v. And we want to write one of those vectors, let's just say u, in terms of v and a vector that's orthogonal or perpendicular to v. So we're breaking up this vector u and now just draw a right triangle mentally and that's really what we're doing. We now have a vector u which you could think of as the hypotenuse and now you're wanting to go somewhere in the direction of v and then you want to go orthogonal to that vector v. You can write u, and I did it very colorfully, but I tried. <laughs> u is now some scalar multiple of the vector v, and the scalar is a, and then we have this component that is orthogonal to v. And if you just evaluate the right-hand side, I hope you find that the left-hand side is equal to the right-hand side. Or any A, and now we want to find an A that makes V and U minus AV orthogonal. We want that second vector, which we can call W, we want that to be orthogonal to V. And we know what it means to be orthogonal. We're now wanting V perpendicular or, 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 or orthogonal to U minus AV. And if we want, or if V is perpendicular to U minus AV, then what do we know about the inner product? We have the vector W, U minus AV, inner product with v and that better be zero. That's what we want. We don't know what a is but we can maybe find it by making it satisfy this relationship. We want v and this other vector u minus a v to be orthogonal. And if that's the case then their inner product is zero. And now we can simply use what we know about the inner product. We can use the additivity of the first slot. We now know from that relationship that we have u and v minus, and now we have 
the inner product of A, V with V, but if A, that scalar is in the first slot, that means it can slide down of the inner product, and we now have A, V, V is equal to zero. We now have the inner product of U and V, and what's V, V? That's the norm of V squared, is another way of writing the inner product of V with itself. And now, really, we are, we're given U and V. The only unknown in that equation is A, and we can solve for it. And A is a scalar. The norm of the vector V squared is a number. The inner product of U with V is a number. And that will give us a number A, which is a scalar in our field of numbers. This now says solving for A, we can now say that A must equal the inner product of U and V divided by the norm of V squared. And that's now the A that we needed to make V orthogonal to U minus AV. That just came out of forcing those two vectors to be orthogonal relative to our inner product. That now says that we can write U as A and A is now U comma V over the norm of V squared times V. That parenthetical quantity is just a scalar in our field of numbers. So if you really want to impress your mom and dad, you just go home and you say, this is how you can decompose a vector, mom. And she'll go, wait a minute, you only have the first piece. This is only in the direction of V. And you'll go, that's correct, Mom. I now need to add in the orthogonal component, which is now U minus AV. And A again is UV inner product over V squared times V. That's a very powerful relationship. It may look a little bit involved, but it's really not that much going on. We just have a certain amount of U in the direction of V, and then what we want to add to that is orthogonal to V, the U minus AV piece. And if you sketched that, for example, let's say that here was V, and maybe this was U, then what we're doing is we are really just saying we want to go to right here. Whoops, I thought I had a different color. And that dashed piece is now U minus a V, where this piece right here is A V with the red hat or the red arrowhead. And that's now a decomposition, an orthogonal decomposition of U into one piece that's in the direction of the second vector that you were given V and an orthogonal piece that gets you back to the tip or the head of U. So keep track of the orthogonal decomposition. Yes? What? So the symbol on the dotted line is supposed to be U minus AV, where A is actually this piece uv over 
v squared. Is that what you were asking? So the signal to the left of u is a point. Oh, that's a, a drawing. If that's confusing you, this was just a line with a little circle. Is that what was confusing? So I was just saying here, I'm grabbing that and labeling it. That was something I learned in drafting as a freshman in college, maybe. I don't know. Who knows? But I'm sure my pencil weight was not consistent, and so they subtracted. I probably only got half credit for this drawing because my line widths were not quite consistent, and my, yeah, it was not a computer drafting club. Mechanical drawing. Is that, is that what you were asking? So I was just trying to label that dashed line. That's fine. Other questions? Let's then move into section 6 of chapter 6, which deals with the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. Suppose we have two vectors, u and v, in our vector space v, capital V, then the absolute value of the inner product of u and v is going to be less than or equal to the norm of u times the norm of v. And the only time that you will have equality in this relationship is if u and v are scalar multiples of each other. They're now in the same direction. If you now have that relationship, you can break that absolute value into two pieces, meaning you can have the negative piece and the positive piece, and that now bounds this norm or the product of the norms of u and v. This just says that you're taking the magnitude of the inner product, and that has to be less than or equal to u and v. You could also write that as saying the minus of the, norm, the product of the norm of u and v must be less than or equal to the inner product of u and v. Let's say u and v were negative, then you know how negative it could go. Or if it was positive, you know how large it can go. We can show where that comes from. Just let u and v be arbitrary vectors in the vector space v. If v is the zero vector, then the inequality is true since both sides are zero. And that's all we would need to show. If we have a non zero V, then using our orthogonal decomposition, we can decompose V into two parts. I'm sorry, we can decompose U into two terms or two parts, one in the direction of this non-zero V and the other orthogonal to V. So if V is not equal to zero, we can decompose U in terms of let's say V and W, where W is in our vector space, and we are going to force 
v and w to be orthogonal. That's really what we were doing in the orthogonal decomposition. If we do that, now we have u is equal to the component of u in the direction of v, that's the inner product of u and v, divided by the norm squared of v times v. So that first piece is just a scalar, scaling the, direct, the vector v plus, and now let's just call that second piece w. This we know we can do because of what we just derived in the orthogonal decomposition. This is nothing new, this first step. We have a non-zero vector v. We can now use that to decompose u into two pieces. Well, if w and the first term on the right-hand side of that equality are orthogonal, then we can relate those with the Pythagorean theorem, or we can talk about the lengths of these or the norms of these from the Pythagorean theorem because that applies when we have orthogonal pieces or vectors. So by Pythagorean, since V and W are, are perpendicular, we know that U squared, or the norm of U squared, is equal to the norm of UV's inner product over V squared V, the norm of that vector squared, plus the norm of W squared. Now, remember what this is. Again, I'm using my crazy symbol or grab, my handle. I'm now grabbing what I've circled in parentheses. What is that? A is now a scalar. And we know how that scalar performs when it's underneath the norm or what, how we can change that. We can slide it outside of the norm to produce that scalar squared, scaling what's left inside, and that's just v squared. Or if we do it in a couple of steps, we can now say that the absolute value of uv over v squared squared times v inner product with v plus W squared. Or what I had already just said is that Are we okay with what I've done so far? And this, well, let, we can simplify that a little bit. This scalar is parameterized in such a way that what's in the denominator is what's being scaled also, meaning we have a v squared and we have a v to the fourth downstairs. We can cancel some of those powers of the norm of V. So that now we can say that U squared is equal to, let's say the absolute value of UV squared. We now have V to the fourth times V squared. Let's get rid of two of those, and we're just left with v squared down below plus w squared. Is that okay? 
And what do we know? Well, by the positivity argument, we know that, that the norm of W is non-negative. But we could, if we wanted to, neglect that and say that U, the norm of U squared must be bigger than the first piece on the right. Meaning I'm going to essentially get rid of this piece because I know that's bigger than, well, I can actually say it's this if it's something other than the zero vector. So I can say this is going to be positive. by the positivity of the inner product. And if I know that, then I can say, or maybe I want to just say that, now I can put this u squared is greater than or equal to that. I've just said that if I neglect the little additional positive number on the right, then the left must be a little bit bigger than that in general. So it's greater than or equal to. And now I can simply multiply both sides through because we assumed V was non-zero. So we're able to divide by it. We can multiply it. Let's now multiply both sides. by that non-zero value. And now we have the norm of u squared times the norm of v squared is greater than or equal to the absolute value of the inner product of uv squared. And now we could take this positive square root of both sides and flip it around, I kind of like to have the less than or equal to on this so that I now have the absolute value of the inner product of u with v is less than or equal to the norm of u times the norm of v. And that's what we were setting out to show, the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. Did I have to invoke the particular inner product in that derivation or in that proof? No, I never had to define an inner product, did I? So this is supposed to work. This will work however you define the inner product, as long as the inner product is a valid inner product. This required no definition. of an inner product. And by the properties of the absolute value, I can, like we've done earlier, say that the inner product of uv needs to be bigger than or equal to the negative of the no product of the norm of u and v, and it has to be less than or equal to the positive product of u and v. So I now have the negative of the norm of V times the norm of U is less than or equal to the inner product of U and V. And that's less than or equal to the product of the norm of U and the norm of V. I can now scale all of those three pieces by the product of u and v. And that now gives me a 1 on the right, a minus 1 on the left, and something bounded by minus 1 and 1 in the middle. I'm simply going to divide all pieces by the norm of u times the norm of v. I can now say I have minus 1 is less than or equal to the inner product of u and v 
divided by or scaled by this product of norms of u and v less than or equal to 1. And that now, what's inside there, is sort of begging to be re-thought of. Or you could now say that we could think of that as the cosine of an angle theta. Cosine of an angle is between minus 1 and 1. And that angle theta, we can now say, is the angle between u and v. Meaning the inner product of u and v tells you how u and v are aligned. If you scale it by the norm of those two vectors, then you have something between minus 1 and 1, and that now you can think of as an angle, or the cosine of an angle. Questions on that? So that's CSI. That's easier to say than cauchy schwarz inequality. Yes? If both vectors are zero, then what do we know about any zero vector? It's orthogonal to itself, right? So now the cosine of what... Well, if their angle is zero, then they're on top of each other. So the cosine of zero is one. You were asking the other question, though, weren't you? So now you're saying, what do we want to say for the angle theta? Now you could say it's pi over two, for example, or 90 degrees, if the result is zero or if u is orthogonal to v. Now you need to just pick an angle theta that's 90 degrees or pi over 2. The norm of 0, what is the norm of the 0 vector? 0, right? Well, we wouldn't want to plug zero into the denominator here. So if you have, this was assuming that u and v were both non-zero. That's when you would want to use this. If one of those is zero, then you don't really want to be dividing by zero. Because you know automatically that if one is a zero vector, it's orthogonal to any other vector and you don't have to really go through this sort of definition of an angle. You now know it's 90 degrees. Is that okay? But if u and v are both non-zero, then you can use this formula or this relationship to define an angle between them or that separates those. And if you just went from 0, which is on the right, as far as your angle, then you go through pi over 2, then you go to pi to get the minus 1. Is sort of one way to think of that. That was Cauchy-Schwarz, which I think was section 6. Let's move into section 9, logically, <laughs> and talk about the triangle inequality. Now you have to fill in the gaps. But these are the main points of chapter 6. Again, let's say that we have two vectors, u and v, in a vector space. Then the, the norm of the sum of those two vectors is less than or equal to the norm of u plus the norm of v. Is there a possibility of an equality here?
And basically this, just sort of think of a triangle in your head. You know that any side of that triangle has to be less than the sum of the lengths of the other two sides. That's really all this is saying. But now we're generalizing it to vectors in a vector space. And we're dealing with the norms of those vectors. But here you could have equality if u and v are not only aligned, but they're also non-negative multiples of each other. You wouldn't want them to be opposite. Then u plus v could be zero, and so it's not going to equal the lengths of u and v. So they need to be aligned and going in the same direction, or non-negative scalars of each other for equality. So equality, if and only if, u and v are non-negative scalar multiples. Then you could have the length of u plus v, you're just walking in the same direction, equaling u and v, it's the length. You really don't have much of a triangle. You don't have any area in that triangle. Now you're always just going in the same direction. Let's show this. Again, just assume we have two vectors. We're not picking those to be any particular u and v, just given any u and v then we can have the sums, or the norm of the sum squared. But we can write this in terms of inner products, because we know how to play with inner products. What's this as an inner product expression? Just the vector, inner product with itself. And here the vector is u plus v. We can now write this as u plus v inner product with u and v, or u plus v. But now we can apply what we know about the first slot in additivity. We can now say that we can basically pull this apart, this inner product. We can have u inner product with u plus v and we can add that to v inner product with u and v. And what do we know about additivity of the second slot? Is it special? No, we don't really have to do anything. It's also additive, isn't it? So now we can perform the same process with the second slot, and we have u inner product with u plus the inner product of u and v, that's from the first piece, plus v inner product with u, plus v inner product with v. Are we okay with those terms? We've just written some definition, or we've just used our definitions of the norm and inner product to write down this formula. Now, the only thing that's sort of maybe not allowing us to put pieces together are these two inner products of u and v, meaning let's sort of make those look a little bit more consistent with the order of those ordered pairs by rewriting this one as u comma v conjugate. Or we can now say that we have u comma u plus v comma v, getting the first and the last in that four term expansion, plus u v plus u v conjugate. But what do we know about a complex number plus its complex conjugate? That's just 2 times the real of that complex number. 
we can now write this as the norm of u squared by the inner product of u with itself plus the norm of v squared plus 2 times the real part of the inner product of u and v. That's just using what we know about complex numbers. We have a z, a complex number. We add its conjugate, its complex conjugate. We just get two of the real pieces, or two of the real parts. But we can now bound that. We can now say that the real part of a complex number is less than or equal to the length of the complex number, or the absolute value. Just visualizing a two-dimensional vector, or a two-dimensional number, which is a complex number. Meaning, we can now say that this is less than or equal to u squared, or the norm of u squared, the norm of v squared, plus 2 times the absolute value of the inner product of u and v. We were just using the fact that the real part of a complex number z is less than or equal to the magnitude of that complex number. We now have the norm of u plus v squared is less than or equal to the norm of u squared plus the norm of v squared. And I can actually, I, I'm now wanting to sort of grow this inequality between these two lines. And I'm going to now use CSI. Meaning, what do I know about the magnitude of the inner product of u with v? We know it's less than or equal to the norm of u times the norm of v. Meaning I can now grow this inequality in the blue line by simply saying, well, this must be less than or equal to plus 2 times the norm of u. Whoops. And the norm of v. That's from CSI. But what is this on the right-hand side now? Uh, all of cosines... Oh, you mean this last line. I thought you were meaning from CSI. But now the law of cosines... Uh, doesn't it have a cosine in there somewhere? Yeah, so that's that's now the law of cosines is probably the one a, a little bit above it because it's now an equality, right? The law of cosine. So now I'm almost, so the question was, I see the law of cosines floating around. That's now going off the screen. Is that okay? So now we're invoking some bounding arguments, but that piece on the right is, maybe it doesn't look like it, but that's a perfect square, isn't it? Now we have some number plus another number, those two squared plus two times those numbers. We can now put that together into another expression. We can say that this is now the norm of u plus the norm of v, that quantity squared. That's the right-hand side now. Or we now can say that 
the sum of these two vectors, u plus v squared, is less than or equal to the norm of u plus the norm of v quantity squared. And we can take the positive square root of both sides and end up with our triangle inequality, which is what we were trying to show. We can now say that the norm of u plus v is less than or equal to the norm of u plus the norm of v. Again, did I invoke an inner product definition? No. So all of this is independent of the inner product that you use. You still have these relationships. You still have a triangle inequality. There was no definition of inner product. And that's called, that relationship is called the triangle inequality for obvious reasons. If you now think about this in a two-dimensional setting, let's say this vector is u and here is v. And now we have from the tail of u up to the head of v, here is u plus v. We now know that the length of that third side is less than or equal to the length or the sum of the lengths of the other two sides. Is a way to think of that. That's the triangle inequality. We went from 6.6 .6, Cauchy Schwarz CSI to triangle inequality 6.9 so we added 3 need to go to the next prime 5 so now let's go to 614 <laughs> this is how I'm deciding to jump 614 is now parallelogram equality. But these are all just numbers, right? Or equation labelings, so I'm not making that many jumps, I guess. Went from equation 6.6 six to 6.9 and now we're into 6.14, equation 14 in chapter 6. The parallelogram equality. Now we're dealing with equality if u and v are vectors in a vector space v, then we can make the following equality. We can say that the norm of u plus v squared plus the norm of u minus v squared is equal to 2 times the norm of u squared plus the norm of v squared. And where do we get this parallelogram thing going? Well, u plus v, we could say is here's u and here's v. There's u and v. And I think it's clear what u plus v is. That's right here. u minus v. Now if we sort of had u and we subtracted v from it, you're essentially going to be getting the other sort of diagonal in this parallelogram. Meaning, if I can do this, let's say that I'm not going to draw this very parallelogram-y, probably. 
that there is V and there is U again. And if we took U and subtracted V from it, you could say that that's now this line. So that now if I have U and I subtract, and now sort of, now how do I want to do this? I want to go to the board, but if we had U and we subtracted V from it, we would be going right here. And as a vector, that is this vector right there, and that's really what this vector is. We're not worrying about where they start or end. We just want the vector. So that this vector here is u minus v. Is that somewhat clear? And what we're saying is if we take these diagonals, find their norm and square them, then that's like going around the perimeter of this parallelogram in a sense. We have the length of u and we square it and we're going to take that twice. So now we sort of walk those two distances and now we look at v, the norm, or the norm of v and square it and we take two of those. So it's like we're going around the perimeter and that's equal to, in a sense, these diagonal pieces. That's what that line above now says. Let's see if we can show that. Again, let's start with two arbitrary vectors in our vector space V, U and V. And now we have U plus V squared plus, whoops, u minus v squared. But we know how to rewrite that, don't we? As inner products, meaning we can say that that's u plus v inner product with itself plus u minus v inner product with itself. And now we can start playing with all the additivities of the different slots. Meaning if the first one is going to be u, u plus v, plus v, u plus v. Then we have with the second piece, u with u minus v. And then will you allow me to take the scalar minus one outside of the inner product? I now have minus v with u minus v. All I'm using there is the additivity of the first slot on both of those two pieces. And now I, the second slot also enjoys additivity, which is nice, so that now I can say, let me now apply additivity of the second slot to the two blues and the two greens. Meaning I now have u with u plus u with v plus v with u plus v with v. I'm running out of room, so I'm going to hit carriage return and do it in green. I now have u with u. Maybe this is good. Now I can kind of see what pieces are aligned, but it's a little bit staggered, but you can do the alignment. Then what do I have? I'm going to pull that scalar negative out of the next one, and I now have minus uv. Make sure I'm doing this right. Then I have minus, whoops, that was V, wasn't it? My V's and U's are looking more and more the same. But yours can look much different. You can typeset yours more effectively. Minus V with U. And then I have a minus, a minus, don't I? 
plus V with V. And what do I have? Now I have a couple of U's with itself. I have a UV minus a UV. I have a plus VU and a minus VU. Those are canceling, and I have two V's with itself. Or I now have, let's say, a mutual color. We'll use black now with green and blue, so that I now have two U and U plus two V with V. And those are now, I can factor the two out, and I now have the norm of U squared plus the norm of V squared, all scaled by two. And again, that's equal to the sum of U and V's norm squared plus the sum of u minus v's norm squared, that's equal to twice u's norm squared plus v's norm squared. And what did I do with the inner product? Did I have to specify a particular inner product in that development? No, I did not. So no definition of the inner product. Now we have a lot of different relationships. We have Cauchy-Schwarz, we have orthogonality, or the orthogonal decomposition. We have, what else did we, did we derive? The triangle inequality, and now we have the parallelogram equality. Let's now use some of these to help us maybe more effectively develop a set of basis vectors because we know that we love basis vectors. That's going to give us a way to play with some of these ideas. Let's now look at developing the idea of an orthonormal basis. Meaning first we need to define what we mean by orthonormal. We call a list of vectors orthonormal if the vectors are all pairwise orthogonal. And each vector is normal or has a norm of one. In other words, given a list let's say E1, E sub 2, up to E sub M, that list of vectors, the list is orthonormal if, if we form the pairwise inner product, let's say of vector E sub I with vector E sub J, then that inner product will be, and now we're saying they're, the norm of these vectors is one, and they're all pairwise orthogonal. Meaning the only time you are going to obtain a non-zero result from the inner product is when I and J are the same, when the vectors are the same. Any other time you're going to get a zero. And what answer are you going to get when those vectors are the same for the inner product? One. So this is going to actually be this Kronecker delta. 
we could say the delta sub ij, which just means that the right-hand side is equal to 1 when i is equal to j. Boy, that's a pretty bad arrow. That's not much better. Better quit. By that, we just mean that delta sub i j is equal to 1 if i equals j and 0 otherwise. That's the notation that we're using. If we have orthonormal lists, then that's a nice thing. Let's look at Proposition 15 in Chapter 6. Suppose we start with an or orthonormal list of M Michigan such vectors. If E sub 1, E sub 2 through E sub M is an orthonormal list, NV, then if we scale each of those vectors with a scalar, A, A sub 1 for E1, and add that to A sub 2 times E2, and A sub M, E sub M, and if we wanted to know what's the norm of that vector squared, then that's pretty easy to compute. All we have to do is pull off those scalars, find their magnitude, and square it, and add those squared magnitudes together, meaning this is now equal to the magnitude of A1 squared. A1, again, is a scalar, plus A sub 2 squared, plus A sub M squared. And that's true for all scalars, a1, a sub 2, a sub m, nf. Meaning if you build up some vector as a linear combination of orthonormal vectors, then you can pretty quickly find the length of that vector or the norm of that vector squared. We're, let's prove that to ourselves. Now what do we have? We have this A1, E1, plus A sub 2, E2, plus A sub M, E to the M, squared. But that's the inner product of that vector with itself which is A1E1 plus A2E2 plus A sub M E sub M with A1E1 plus A sub 2 E sub 2 plus A sub M E sub M. And now let's just sort of break this up into pieces using the additivity of the first slot. No, you don't want to do that? You have your no-dose, right? Or your caffeine? You've taken that, you've ingested that. I did before class. Maybe it's not showing. But now we have A1E1 with all of these pieces on the right. And we have A sub 2, E sub 2 with all of those pieces on the right, etc. Well, we can write that a little bit more concisely by saying, let's look at the sum from L equal 1 to M of A1, E1, inner product with A sub L, E sub L. Is that okay? 
then we need to sum from L equal 1 to M A sub 2 E sub 2 with A sub L E sub L. And we just keep going until we pick up a sub m, e sub m with all of the others, a sub l, e sub l. But that's begging us to sort of introduce another summation. Now that looks the same if we simply now sum over the first slot. And that's just m such sums meaning now we can do this sum from, what do I want to say? Oh, I can't draw k's, but bear with me. k equal 1 to m. And now we do this sum from L equal 1 to m. Now we have an A sub k, E sub k, with A sub L, E sub L. Is that okay? And now we can start pulling out those scalars from the first slot and the second slot. The first slots just come out. The second slots come out with a conjugate. Or we now can say that this is the sum from k equal 1 to m and the sum from l equal 1 to m of a sub k a sub L conjugated with the inner product of E sub K, E sub L. But what do we know about the inner product of these orthonormal vectors? They're all zeros except when K and L are the same. So that this is now this delta of K L but the only time that's going to be non-zero is when k and l are the same. That's now going to collapse one of these sums away so that I can now say that's now the sum from l equal 1 to m of a sub l, a sub l conjugate. Is that okay? And now we just invoke what we know about a complex number times its complex conjugate. That's the magnitude squared. This is now the sum from L equal 1 to M of the magnitude of A sub L squared. But that's now the magnitude of A sub 1 squared plus the magnitude of A sub 2 squared plus dot 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 plus a sub m's magnitude squared. And that's what we were trying to show. Question on that. Let's quickly go through another corollary using that result, which is corollary 616, which says every orthonormal list of vectors is in fact linearly independent. So if you have an orthonormal list, each one of those vectors is linearly independent, or the whole set is linearly independent. And the proof is really just an extension of what we just applied. Let's now take this set of vectors, E1, E2, up to E sub m, as an orthonormal list. And let's just now write a linear combination of those vectors. 
suppose we write A1 E1 plus A sub 2 E sub 2 plus A sub M E sub M. And let's say that we found A's such that this sum is equal to zero. Let's say that that's true. But what do we know from the previous proposition? We know how to find the length of that vector, don't we? We know that if that vector is zero, the zero vector, or we can write the norm of that is now a1 e1 plus a sub 2 e2 plus dot 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 plus a sub m e sub m. The norm of that squared is equal to a1 squared plus the norm of a sub 2 squared plus the norm of a sub m squared. But that's all equal to zero. And what does that mean? If I have a bunch of numbers, and these are non-negative numbers that sum to zero, the only way that can happen is if all of those pieces are zero. And if all of those pieces are zero, or those coefficients are zero, in that defining relationship that was equal to zero, the only way that that vector can equal zero is if the coefficients are zero. That says that those vectors are linearly independent. Therefore, we've now shown that those vectors, if they were a list of orthonormal vectors, that's also a set of linearly independent vectors, and that's what corollary 616 was telling us. We'll pick up with that on Wednesday.